We're recording on August the 3rd in 1998. We're talking with Rod Bates, who is the general manager for Nebraska Educational Television and director of University Station KUON-TV. Rod, for the purposes of the historical interview, can you tell us a little bit about, please, when you came to Nebraska and what your career in broadcasting has to this point? Sure. Uh, I came to Nebraska in 1975, and I was supposed to be here for one year, a one-year assignment. Uh, Ron Hall actually was station manager at the time, program manager, and was on vacation in San Diego where I had been working at KPBS television. And he said, uh, I interviewed him, and he said, well, I have a one-year appointment. That's all I can offer you, but uh, it's a wonderful place to be. And I'd heard a great deal about Nebraska, and I thought, well, this is a perfect place for me to go. I'll get a year in in Nebraska, put it on the resume, and move on. That was 1975, 23 years ago. I can't get out of here. <laughs> it's actually a wonderful place to be. Uh, I came as a producer director. That lasted for one year, and at the end of that year assignment, Ron offered me a permanent position as a producer director. And it seems like every time uh, I had the resume out, dusted off, and ready to look around, something nice would happen. I went from producer director promoted to senior producer. And then from senior producer, Jack McBride asked me if I'd consider a career change. As a senior producer, quite often you get involved in raising money for projects that you want to make happen, but there isn't money available, so you end up doing presentations and looking for the money yourself. And I was pretty good at that, and so he said, would you consider a career change in moving into development? So I moved into development as assistant director of development. What year was that? Uh, that was probably 1983 or 84. And uh, then director of development, and then I was ready to leave again, only this time uh, it wasn't a career change. I was very happy here, but my father was dying of cancer back in Ohio where I grew up. So I interviewed for a position back there and was offered a very nice position at WOSU, which is the public television station assigned to the university or the Ohio State University. And Dale Utz was general manager and offered me a wonderful position there as development director. And I was prepared to, ex uh, to accept that position uh, when then Governor Kerry uh, stepped in and said, no, I'd like to have you stay here and help me with an initiative. And I said, well, what's that initiative? And it was, uh, at that time, he had formed a telecommunications and information blue ribbon panel to look at ways in which we could exploit some areas of telecommunications within the state of Nebraska to affect the economy. And I said, well, what kind of a staff would I have? And he said, well, tell me what kind of a staff you'd like and what would I do? And he says, you tell me what to do. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Panel came back with a number of recommendations, and I was assigned uh, the responsibility to try to jumpstart some new industry. So, again, it was an offer I couldn't refuse, so I stayed in Nebraska uh, during his term as governor. And then when he decided not to seek a second term, I founded my own communications company and took the contacts that I had within the Department of Economic Development with my communication background to try to teach corporations how to use this technology to train their employees and market their products and services. So I've been here 23 years, first at Nebraska Educational Television, then state government, then I own my own business, and now I've come full circle back to public broadcasting as the general manager. What years did you operate the private company? Well, when he decided not to run for a second term, I started the company in 1987. And I came back here in 1996, so roughly 10 years I had my own company. What uh, led you to be interested in being a producer director originally? I was actually in the military, in Armed Forces Radio and Television. Started out in accounting and finance, actually, and uh, worked for a little, a little Southern Baptist woman in South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, who had no appreciation for what it was like to be in the military. Very difficult to work for. And uh, there was a call for volunteers to, trans, uh, to transfer, to retrain in broadcasting. And so a friend of mine and I said, let's sign up for it, thinking it must be radar or something. But actually, they had radio and television in the service, armed forces radio and television, for those military that were stationed overseas. So I was trained by the military in radio and television, then went to Korea at armed forces, the Armed Forces Korea Network, and uh, fell in love with broadcasting, uh, both in radio and in television. And I ended up in television and liked it and uh, went back uh, home when I got out of the service and then moved to Southern California to get my degree in telecommunications and film. 
What, uh, what jobs have you held in broadcasting in the military? Every job you can imagine. I started out as a floor director, as everyone does, pulling cables and, and uh, running camera. I ran audio. Uh, I ran the switcher, video switcher, was a producer director, uh, wrote scripts, hung lights, built sets. I did virtually every position that was available. In fact, I used the old turret lenses and the old Zoomar lenses and uh, still have some pictures of that. Had a great time, worked on remotes, uh, worked in the telescene area, uh, threading film and everything. When I got out of the service and went uh, to school, I applied for a job in San Diego with the public television station there and had to start all over again as a floor director and running camera and doing the same sorts of things I did before. And I also picked up some part-time work freelancing in cable television and some of the other areas in the San Diego area just to get more items for my resume. When I applied for the position in Nebraska, I said to Ron Hall, I'll do anything, but I'm not starting over again. This is too many times. And he agreed to start me as a producer-director. What year do you say is the first time that you started in broadcasting? 1967, I would say formally. Uh, I was very interested and went through formal training in the military in 1967. Um, 1967 is the same year I went to Korea as well and then ever since then I've been involved in broadcasting so about 31 years now. How did you become interested in non-commercial educational or public broadcasting as compared to commercial broadcasting? It's real interesting uh, when I was in the service working in broadcasting I found a number of people who had already graduated and had their degrees and I asked for their opinions on the best broadcast schools Michigan State came up, uh, that was very well known, and of course Southern California, UCLA, USC, and San Diego State came up from a number of people. Uh, Hal Green was one who's still an anchor person, I think, in San Diego, or now in Los Angeles. Uh, a friend of mine, when I got out of the service, wanted to move out to the Southern California area, and so I thought I would investigate San Diego State a little more closely uh, because I'd heard so many good things about it, and uh, that's how it all started. I mean, that's the school I selected, and it was a very good choice. Very hands-on. You did everything. You built sets. Uh, you produced and directed. You did it all. So it was a, a very, very good school. But you're growing up years, and you were, you're a native of? Ohio. I grew up in Ohio, in Columbus. Was always kind of interested in it, but never took broadcasting very seriously until I got into the service. When you came to Nebraska and took over the uh, opportunities that were offered you here as producer-director, what kinds of things did you find when you entered the Nebraska Educational Telecommunications world in 1975? When I went to San Diego State, that was my introduction. I went to school there to get my degree, but they had a wonderful public television station there. And once I moved into the San Diego area, it's that one of those defining moments where you decide, um, are you going to do this for real? And if so, uh, it's time to stop flipping hamburgers for a living and start making your living. Uh, doing something that you can put on a resume. So everything I did to earn money to get my degree in San Diego was related in one way or another, either freelance activity or working for the local public television station. That's when I got a good taste of what public broadcasting was all about. Very good people there that remain friends to this day. And I fell in love with public broadcasting and what it's all about. So then I would had experience in the military with Armed Forces Radio and Television and now I had experience with public broadcasting, very similar in, in that they're publicly subsidized, but public television was just starting at that time, was very young. And I had heard great things about Nebraska educational television. It had a terrific reputation. And I felt it was something that uh, I'd really like. I grew up with a father who hated what he did, but he grew up during the Depression when was, and was very afraid to let go of the job he had because he didn't have a college degree and he was taught that you hang on for dear life and he was he had reached middle age and gone through a depression had bills to pay and rent and kids to take care of and so he didn't want to let go of that job so what we heard was a steady complaint about how hard that job was and I had always made a vow that I'm never gonna do that I'm gonna do something if you have to get up and go to work every day you better do something you really love doing and so I would probably do this for free if I had to. In fact, I did for many years. When you're in public broadcasting, uh, you get used to working for very low wages. So, But it has been enjoyable every day getting up and going to work. It's, it's, the work you're doing is very important. What was the operation, the level of operation in 1975 of Nebraska Educational Television 
compared to 1983, 1998, and so forth? It's been very interesting to watch the evolution of uh, Nebraska Educational Telecommunications, and I tell people this all the time, and it's hard for them to understand, but this is probably the premier network in the world, and it truly is. And having been in San Diego and around the country looking at other public broadcasting operations, this is clearly one of the best. 1975, if you go back to the 1950s, we were a single transmitter. And that's what, there's 353 uh, transmitter sites, stations, if you will, in the PBS system. Many of those are a single microwave tower. In Nebraska, we have nine such stations that make up a statewide network, 17 translators. And that's what it looked like when I got here in 1975. Started with one in 1954. In the 60s, we added a statewide commission to operate this statewide network. That, in and of itself, made us very unique in the United States. So in about the 1970s, we were one of only, oh, a handful of statewide networks. Today, there's 28 statewide networks, still uh, only a little over half the states in the public broadcasting service are statewide networks. Now you move from 75 into the 80s and it gets very interesting. That part of our history is, is extremely interesting. Uh, not only did you have a statewide educational telecommunications commission that operated the statewide network and the University of Nebraska operating the flagship station, we had wisely consolidated a lot of our production in this facility we're sitting in right here today. Many stations can't survive. We certainly couldn't have survived trying to build production facilities all across the state. The population just wouldn't warrant that. This was one of the smartest things we ever did in Nebraska. Uh, then came a number of other services, and if you layer those services on top of the broadcast service, this place is very unique, and it's what separates it from every other place on the planet. For example, cable television. The evolution of cable television is real interesting. It was originally established to try to provide television services to rural areas that couldn't pick up that signal off the rooftop antenna. But it quickly caught on in the urban areas, probably more quickly than it did in the uh, rural areas, because if you put up a master antenna and pulled in distant signals, you could, on a cable, offer people in a city a number of different viewing options. And so it caught on in the cities first. Well, we saw the possibility of feeding our signal on cable as opposed to microwave. And in fact, if we didn't get on that cable and people started subscribing, they wouldn't receive our signal because we weren't on that cable system. So if you look historically, there was a, there was a move by all broadcasters to pass what they call a must-carry rule, where uh, they were, cable companies were required to set aside 4 to 7 percent of their capacity to carry educational television. We got on the cable systems early at first, but today there's 25 cable systems in Nebraska that carry us, and that represents well over half of the television households. Now, if you look at just cable, we started putting different programs on cable than we had on our regular network. Uh, you buy programs from PBS were different than other affiliates that way. ABC, NBC, and CBS, they pay their affiliates to carry programs. We're just the opposite. We pay to become members of PBS, and then we pay PBS to buy programs to put on our air, which is a very weird concoction, but that's the nature of non-commercial television. Well, when you buy a cer at a certain threshold, you get all of the programs, and there's not enough hours in the day for you to broadcast them, so we started putting some of those programs on cable. Then we noticed uh, for a long time we were recording the Nebraska unicameral and editing that tape down every night and putting a summary on television called Capital View. We found that when we had this access to cable, we could take the output of those cameras that were already in place down at the legislature, just take the output and put that on the cable, and in essence we created our own C-SPAN, N-SPAN I guess you'd call it, but we have now during the legislative session live coverage of whatever's happening down at the cable going to all those cable households across the state. It gives us a lot of flexibility and we start putting differentiated programs. So now there's really two network services. One's a cable service and one's a broadcast service. Now, as a matter of clarification, that 25 percent, that's the educable or the cable service. The broadcast signal is on? On a network and started but, off as a microwave. But is on more cable systems than the 25 percent. Yes, right? right. So essentially the over-the-air the over the channels, the nine stations, 
would be on how many cable systems are reaching how much penetration in terms of the, the homes in Nebraska? Um, you know, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I think there is a must-carry rule for all mm -hmm. the cable systems, and as long as we're considered local, because we're statewide, we should be legally on every cable system in the state. Educable is a bit different. We have to fight for that one. Uh, you don't, some cable companies would argue that they did set aside a channel for educational television and that this is a separate channel. We actually send out letters. I think I signed a thousand letters last year to, to our members who support us and send us money saying, go to your local cable company and insist that they carry Educable, which is the other program service. And it's based on that grassroots demand when they go to the local cable provider that got us on 25 additional systems. Rob, we talk a little bit about technology, and, and you can go about far back enough to realize as a producer that you used film. Oh, yeah. Okay, film the chemical process, sprocket holes, little images, not video or videotape, although it certainly has been around for a long time. Compare the evolution of film to video cameras with the issue of video cameras, videotape to computers in more recent times. It's a fascinating process. When I first came here, I was in San Diego, as I said, and while in San Diego, we had what's called a Moviola flatbed editor. Now, in Hollywood terms, the, a flatbed editor back in the 70s was pretty big stuff, and I thought we were hot stuff. I came to Nebraska, there were five Steambeck flatbed editing systems, which was unbelievable to me. Steambeck was even better than Moviola, and they had five suites. We were shooting an extraordinary amount of film right here in Nebraska. When I got here, there were three full-time scenic designers. I said, three full-time scenic designers? How many sets are you designing a year? 300 at that time. There was an enormous amount of uh, production going on. Four full-color studios here. We had one music recital hall that had been converted in San Diego, which is a major market. So film was the technology of the day, and we shot an extraordinary amount of film. One of the first assignments I had was to shoot filmed highlights of the basketball games at the University of Nebraska when Joe Cipriano was there. So we'd go over with a little bell and howl and shoot highlights and have it processed overnight, transferred tape, and came over here and did a highlight show. That now has been completely replaced by portable video equipment. Uh, completely. We had five Steambeck editing suites. There are zero today. We still have cans of film down in the vault, but n virtually no one shoots film anymore unless you do so for aesthetic reasons. The transfer started coming. I don't know if you remember that Nebraska N logo dispute that happened years ago. We had the same logo that NBC unveiled January 1. I forget what year it was even, but it was uh, at that time there was a settlement of both cash and equipment out of court. And that was our first video camera. It was an old ENG camera that was a, uh, it was awful. It was a Bosch camera. In fact, a guy I worked with in uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television was a camera operator for NBC Sports and came here to do the Junior Olympics. And we ran into one another and we were reminiscing, catching up on the old days. We started talking about the settlement. He says, oh, that camera you got? I'm very familiar with that camera. It's been dropped down so many stairs, and people used to stand on the processor to see up over walls. We had a lot of trouble with it because it had a broken motherboard, and it really wasn't portable. It's what we called luggable around here, and we built these big carts to lug the stuff around, which made it completely not portable. So the early days were very difficult, but today, a camera this equipment... This was the late 1970s. This was the late 70s, exactly. Uh, but by the 80s, we clearly were getting portable. And now the decks were uh, attached right to the, the cameras and very, very light, easy to carry around. And so it truly became portable. Now, if you look at the last, oh, five to ten years of production, our studio production is going down to the right, if you would graph it, because almost everything we do is done on location. Much of that documentary work is done on ENG portable equipment, but we also have a remote truck that uh, is one of the best in the country that goes out all over the, if it's a multiple camera shoot and a big remote, they'll do it on the truck. Otherwise, documentaries are done with little portable equipment. And our studio production, we still do quite a bit, but not nearly what we did at one time. So it's evolved very, very differently. Now you talk about where we're going, it's gonna get very interesting because of this move from analog to digital that we're facing. It's not inconceivable. In fact, there's been some prototype cameras now where 
Instead of recording on tape, we're going to be recording on hard drives. And you'll rarely even see any of this material go to tape anymore. Today you take that tape and the way you edit it is you digitize those scenes and put it on a digital editing system, a random uh, access editing machine. And uh, you take the output to tape and put the tape on the air. We're going to see the elimination of tape, I think, before too very long. It's going to get very, very interesting. Much faster, probably different. I, I, I hesitate to say faster, quicker, better, cheaper is, is what everybody says. But I think uh, the way I move from a typewriter to a word processor is similar. I don't, I don't, I take just as much time to put out a letter, but I do a lot more editing and it's a much stronger, better letter. Uh, but I've redefined my work. I think we're doing the same in video at this point. We're, we're moving from analog to digital. We're redefining how we do the work. The product will be a great deal better than it was before, but I don't think you're going to see uh, less work. You're going to see a lot better work. How do you see production personnel, public broadcasting personnel, people you work with in private business, and so forth, adapting to technologies, adapting from film to video, adapting from film to a hard drive? I think, it's, uh, I think it's creating a lot of anxiety. Some people love change. They thrive on change. I mean, I'm one of those people, and I think a lot of broadcasters have that kind of mentality. They, they in fact, were change agents. I did a paper on this uh, for the Information Technology Forum at PBS where I liken broadcasting to sort of the industrial age, and the computer revolution is the information age. If you look at this transition we're facing, that is, we're going from analog to digital, it changes the nature of everything we're doing. And if you look at television sets, if you think about this, I asked the question of the people I presented to, how many people owned a television set? And almost everybody in the room put their hands up. I mean, more people own television sets than telephones. How many own two television sets? Probably 75% of the people in the room. How many own three television sets? And probably half the room put their hand up. I asked how many people had black and white sets that still work. And probably a dozen hands went up. It's incredible, but you think of it, when you buy a television set, you expect it to last about 20 years. That's an industrial attitude. The computer attitude is, you buy it today, in 18 months, throw it away, it's obsolete, you've got to get a whole new package. That's the way the computer generation thinks. So there's this debate over the new receivers uh, that are going to be high-definition television receivers. Should we go to 720p, 720 progressive, 720 scanning lines that are progressive scan, or should we go to 1080i, which is interlaced? Broadcasters say go to 1080i because that's high quality. It'll cost a lot, five to $6,000, they estimate, for a receiver. Computer guys are going, why would you do that? Go to 720p. All the consumers will see this as a huge improvement, and then in a couple, it'll be a lot cheaper than five or six thousand dollars. A couple of years, we'll tell them to throw it away, and we'll we'll take them up to the next threshold. Different kind of thinking. Broadcasters are sort of that industrial thinker. Uh, you expect that shelf life to last a lot longer. We've had the same format in television since the 1940s. 525 scanning lines interlaced. It's been the same. We're going to chuck it now and move into a new standard. We're going to do a standards conversion. They do that every 18 months in the computer industry. That's a way of life. So we've got to change the way we think. You plan differently. Nebraska was a pioneer in interactive production. And one of the biggest things we went through with video disc technology was rethinking how we produce and plan programs. It's no longer a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not linear. It's branch thinking. So we had producers literally with charts all over the walls, you know, with these branches in their design. We'll reach this point, we have a decision point. And then we go this way or this way. And once you go this way, we have to have another branch. Had to completely rethink the way you design and produce um, production for interactive learning. We're still doing that today. We've got now over 50 people working full time in interactive multimedia. But it's a different way of thinking. Another difference is we, we inherited as broadcasters spectrum when it was considered swampland. Nobody knew what this spectrum was worth. We actually have developed this swampland into prime real estate. And that's what's driving this whole evolution from analog to digital. Now that it's prime real estate, the government wants some of that spectrum back. Well, how are we going to get it back? We'll 
digitize this analog broadcasting industry. We'll give them a finite amount of spectrum. We'll recapture some of that spectrum and make it available to a number of these other wireless devices that have evolved over time. Well, again, if you look at the computer industry, it was first just word processing, or actually it was number crunching to begin with, if you go way back to the, the original Univac or whatever it was, um, Uniac or what, what was Univac. it? Univac. It was just number crunching. That's all it was. And then we added word processing, and then some spreadsheet, and then pretty soon we added graphics. And I can remember when Mosaic came along, everybody thought, wow, is this the greatest? You can actually transmit over phone lines some images. Well, bandwidth hogs, broadcasters, have been doing that since the 40s. That was nothing for us. Their definition of production quality was they had a much lower thrill threshold than we did in broadcasting. Our production quality was way, way up there, very expensive, very cumbersome. We ate up the bandwidth. They saw a little bit of bandwidth as something that's very, very great. And then when we got the compressed video we were sending, you, you could download something off the Internet, but you had to wait an hour and a half to download it, because, and even then it was crude by comparison to broadcasters. So as the broadcast, as the computer industry grew up, it was used to very little, and, and you just give it a little, and they were very happy. Broadcasters couldn't understand that. We were up here in that industrial strength, use up a lot of bandwidth. So we're going to have to learn to manage differently, uh, and they're all coming together on one desktop. So that's the comparison I drew, was broadcasters sort of have an industrial orientation to the business, whereas computer guys grew up having very little to work with, very little, uh, very low thr thrill threshold, so that when something like sending a graphic occurs, that was a big event to them. When you uh, came into the job as producer-director, what was a good television show? What was the formula for a good television show? When you look at something and you said, we really did good work here, what, what, what was good? I'd say, uh, again, this production value was critically important. One of the things that Nebraska prided itself on, it was just an unbelievable factory for turning out very exceptional work. Whether, Even if it was a local production, I had more freedom here than any place ever in the military, out in San Diego, or any place. Even commercial broadcasters were very, very jealous of us because of the production facilities we had here. So I would say uh, first thing that comes to mind is production quality. They took the time to light it properly and build appropriate sets and hire uh, professional talent when possible. Now, we didn't always have the greatest budgets, but I had more freedom than most other people that I knew that were uh, doing Hollywood productions. Uh, a lot of classmates who went into Hollywood or something else struggled for a long time, or commercial, local commercial television pales in comparison to the kinds of things we were doing. Now, we found ourselves in public broadcasting because we didn't have a lot of money collaborating and forming consortia of every form and every nature you can imagine to get the resources necessary. But generally speaking, I think the production quality was very, very high. The other thing is, by definition, uh, it's programming that wouldn't be available otherwise. That's how we define ourselves. It used to be frustrating. We'd do a sports remote, for example. I can remember days when we did the boys basketball tournament when a commercial broadcaster couldn't touch that there weren't enough people that watched it that they could sell anything they couldn't sell ads it grew in popularity so much that channel ten KOLN moved in and said we'd like to do that now it's very hard to let go of that because you build up that audience and that loyalty but there was a big enough audience now that you could make money and so we had to let that go to the commercial uh... advertisers or the commercial broadcasters in this case, we have a very nice relationship with KOLN. We still simulcast it. KOLN gets the Lincoln area, the area that they want, and then we use the statewide transmitters to put it out to the rest of the state. But that's a good example of where I think we were sort of trailblazers, if you will, by doing something that wasn't commercially viable. When it became commercially viable, we have to say, it's okay, let it go, and we'll move on and do something else. How does the concept of localism in public broadcasting fit together in 1998 as compared to 1975 or 1983 or those other years in there? I think localism has never been more important than it is right now. Never. Uh, if you look at commercial broadcasting, again, this is not a criticism of them. They have to do things that return a profit, that return money to the shareholders. 
and it is very difficult and very expensive to get engaged in local production and return a profit on that. So you see a very minimal amount of local production. That's normally news. They spend a great deal of money on local news coverage, so we don't even bother doing that as public broadcasters because that's available. Beyond that, there may be an occasional public affairs program on a Saturday or Sunday morning where they interview newsmakers. But beyond that, there's no other local production that I'm aware of anymore. It just isn't cost effective. We're the only ones left. And last year, we, uh, just to give you an example of how important it is, we preempted a swimming and diving state championship to bring uh, the people of Nebraska an opera with a woman who graduated from Nebraska Wesleyan, who's now uh, a tremendous diva. And I heard from every mother in the state of Nebraska about preempting statewide swimming and diving. Number one, there isn't enough room for all the parents to come to Lincoln and sit in in the swimming and diving well over at the Devaney Sports Complex. And number two, entire towns stop what they're doing to watch the state swimming and diving meets. We're the only ones that can provide that. Uh, it is, there has never been a more important time. Beyond our broadcast uh, television, we haven't even talked about radio, nor have we talked about our, um, uh, our satellite system, closed circuit system, and so forth, some of the other services we provide. So when we take that coverage of the Nebraska legislature, that's another vitally important service. People in the panhandle forever since I've been here have felt estranged from the people back east. Well, we now provide a summary called statewide of weekly news, but in addition to that, we put out live coverage of the legislature, even hearings, so that people don't have to drive clear across the state to hear what's going on at the state capitol. So we have become, I think, second only to Nebraska football as an important resource in this state, and I, I say that very seriously. I mean, we tie this state together in any number of ways. How do you as the general manager handle the financial commitments that's necessary to deal with essentially serving the less populated area? This is very interesting because I think the whole uh, change, all the changes we're facing, we're moving from analog to digital. We've had a satellite now that the state of Nebraska owns, its own, its own transponder for the last nine years. Uh, that contract runs out in another year or 18 months. We have some major decisions we're facing and major, major dollars. There's a mentality right now in the state, since this, since this is a, an historical tape, it's a good time to talk about this. We've seen a shift, I think, in responsibility from the federal to the state and from the state to the local taxpayers to support education. Well, we're an educational institution, Nebraska Educational Telecommunications, and there is an environment that exists right now that says we are fed up with paying these high property taxes and we want to put a cap on it. In fact, there's a proposed constitutional amendment that's going to hit the ballot. If that passes, it will decimate the support for not only Nebraska educational television, but the whole educational system. It's a very, very serious thing, but I think it should be taken seriously. The voters are saying loud and clear, we're paying too many taxes. We want that to stop. I say that because I think we have to change the way we're doing business as Nebraska educational telecommunications. We have enjoyed very, very generous support from the state of Nebraska and from the federal government. But just a couple of years ago, you'll recall, Newt Gingrich proposed eliminating all funding for public broadcasting at a federal level. And now we're facing this property tax mentality, this cap spending mentality that's very, very real. And so we've got, I think, to start planning to be far more entrepreneurial and be more self-sustaining than we've ever been. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons I got this job, is my experience in the private sector, uh, paying attention to, to growing and paying the bills and being self-sustaining, that kind of experience has to be brought now to public broadcasting to look for ways in which we can be more self-supporting. How do you reconcile the interests of the less populated parts of the state, as you indicate here, with the populated parts of the state? Because we are dealing with a mass medium, Obviously, you do count uh, numbers as well as, uh, as uh, geographical miles. How do you handle that? It's very easy for me, uh, and this gets back to the design of this network that is so unique in the United States. When, when the federal government threatened to eliminate all funding for public broadcasting through Newt Gingrich and that, that Congress that came in with the Contract for America, one of the things that uh, 
the Corporation for Public Broadcasting did in response to that was to say, we'll stop giving multiple base grants to communities that are served by more than one public television station. For example, if you go to Washington, there are three public television or more, three or more public television signals serving the Washington, D.C. area. There's WETA, there's Maryland Public Broadcasting, and there's another, I, I don't remember what it is. New Orleans has the same problem. There are three public television entities just serving the New Orleans area. Each one of those stations gets a separate base grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. They said one way in which we can cut the cost of supporting public broadcasting is in those areas where there are overlaps, we're going to eliminate all multiple base grants. You'll get one base grant and you stations will have to figure out how you're going to get along with just one base grant. It is causing tremendous problems in those areas because they've established their own identities over time, they're operating independent of one another, and now they've got to get along. Well, Nebraska started out that way. We started out sharing a statewide network, so we are clearly the opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to overlap. We're the most efficient model in the entire system. So it's easier for us and far more cost effective to serve the entire state of Nebraska than any other place. We were set up to do that. There's no way you could ever, ever support a service out in the sand hills and some of the more sparsely populated areas or you'd see commercial television stations out there. There just aren't enough people to serve. But when you combine all your assets and, and co-locate the uh, one production facility and consolidate the big investment of production equipment and everything else and create that service with transmitters out there, financially it's very doable. So I, we're in very good shape. It's interesting to watch the transition. I think early in television, in educational television background, teachers in small towns were very threatened by us because if we would put out educational curricula over the airwaves, it would threaten their job. It could eliminate it. Now we're seeing rural America fight for its life. I mean, there's a migration taking place from rural to urban, and some of those high schools are having trouble struggling to get by. At the same time, you have the University of Nebraska upping its entrance requirements, requiring two years of a foreign language, and some of these small towns can't even recruit a foreign language instructor. Now what do you do? Now we're no longer a threat, we're saving them because you can have 85% of your curricula in a small town and just import maybe 15% and that town's high school remains viable. So now we're looked on as a friend, not as a foe. It's changing the entire nature of how we serve rural America. Rod, when you um, try to get uh, support from the audience and so forth, sometimes uh, that's uh, uh, on the air uh, fundraising and uh, you uh, Fortunately, take the position that you can go out and do that yourself and you can let people see what the manager looks like and relate to you as a person. How important is that particular aspect of getting public support behind the network and how important is it for you to do that? I don't think it's ever been more important for all the reasons we've talked about earlier and that is we are seeing less and less support from public uh, sources. Uh, less federal support, less, uh, more pressure to cut back on government. Government's gotten too big. How That's important not, is it for you, the, the leader, to be out there putting yourself on the line in essence? Well, that private support is critically important. I think for me to be in front of the people is also critically important. Uh, it's critically important because we're not, you're not financing a private party here. This is a public good and a public resource and it's important for me to say that. People, I can't tell you how many people have told me um, They've just come up and said, I see you on public television asking for money. You do a good job. And what they mean by that is, I don't think I'm fancy or slick. They can tell beyond a shadow of a doubt that I believe in this thing. And if they can see it in my eyes and hear it in my words, uh, it becomes critically important to the credibility of this place. If they don't understand it and they don't believe it, if they think this is a sham, we'll lose support just like that. But they know it's real. They feel... Uh, a difference in their communities now. We help support those high schools. We bring those events. We're the only local production service left. We bring coverage of the legislature and it's important for us to tell them what they're getting for their investment. How uh, is your experience as a state government official beyond television useful to you in your present opportunity? I can't tell you how how good it's been. When Bob Kerry asked me to join his administration 
uh, I suddenly became very political. I mean, I'd never considered myself political, if you will. Uh, but by serving in his administration as head of one of his code agencies, you learn a great deal about how state government works in a hurry. And the code agency, just for the historical A purposes. code agency is an agency that reports directly to the governor. The okay. governor appoints the director of those agencies, and you serve at the pleasure of the governor. So when he steps out and a new governor comes in, they replace all those code agencies with people that they entrust. And that agency that you headed was? The Department of Economic Development. And going around the state and talking to corporations and businesses and community leaders was invaluable to me. Uh, it, you understand how state government works. You understand the pressures of uh, politics, both with the administration and working with the legislature and how a bill becomes law and how you communicate with the legislature and how they like to get information. And all of that becomes vitally important to this. Now I'm a commission. I'm back in state government again because I report to a state commission. Now it's not a code agency, but my commissioners are appointed by the governor and approved by the legislature. And even though we're not a code agency, that is the director here isn't appointed by the governor. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you are hired by the commission and by the university. But it's real important for me to understand how this works so that I can communicate effectively with both the administration and the legislative branches of government. What percentage of the job is uh, interface with um, the governor of Nebraska, the United States senators from Nebraska, the members of the House of Representatives from Nebraska? I'd say at the most it's maybe 10 percent of my time. Um, it depends on the time of year. Right now we're we're working fever, feverishly on the new biennial budget. Now, I'm not actually down there talking to the governor or the legislature, but it's all related. We've got to put together the budget strategy to go down and present to both. And so that's going to take up a lot of my time. Then I'll actually have to appear before the legislature and the Appropriations Committee. I'll have to probably talk to the governor's office to allay any fears. Last year, uh, one of our commissioners said, have you communicated this need to the governor's office? And I said, no, and I don't think it had ever been done. And he said, why not? And I said, well, I don't have a good answer for that. And he said, well, why don't we? So we did. And we made an appointment. Chairman of the commission and a, one or two other commissioners and I went down and pleaded our case to the governor's office. And I can tell you, it worked beautifully. It had never been done before, but it's just a matter of going down and knowing how to communicate with the administration and saying these are the needs we have and we'd appreciate your consideration. A lot of strategy involved here. I spend a lot of time with the fiscal analysts. You don't hear much about that. Most people don't, but they're the real keys to this. They understand exactly how this agency works and if you go down and explain to them these are the needs that are coming up, they can help build your case to the legislature's appropriations committee and or the governor's office. In terms of the federal government, we have a National Association of America's Public Television Stations which is the group that sort of bird dogs our cause in Washington. And once a year they have a, a general briefing where we fly back to Washington. I'll take the head of our commission and we'll go back and get a briefing on strategy and message and then we'll visit with every one of our congressional delegates while we're back there. So that happens at least formally, at least once a year, and then we communicate on a crisis by crisis basis, you know, as needed. What the uh combinations of um, production ideas, entrepreneurship, and so forth uh, exist between other public television groups, public radio groups, and your organization? I've never seen a group of people collaborate more because there just are never enough dollars. So there are, it seems like thousands, I'm exaggerating, but there are lots and lots and lots of different affinity groups within the public broadcasting system. For example, we belong to a group that's a satellite consortium. We agree to produce some programs like Japanese foreign language, and somebody else agrees to produce math, and somebody else does science, and then we all share those programs on the satellite with our constituents. So for the cost to Nebraska of producing a Japanese language series, we can offer the kids in Nebraska a whole host of curricula that we can import from our partners around the country into the state of Nebraska. That's just one example. We do outreach programs all the time, all across the country. It might be on heart disease, it might be on cancer, it might be on violence. So on any number of topics, we belong to a public television outreach alliance that helps fashion outreach for all public television stations, and Nebraska is a founding member of that. 
So then when that bro uh, program is broadcast, we have the tools necessary to do outreach to all our constituents again, all the Nebraskans who might be having trouble with an illness or a sickness or something, violence in the classroom or something like that we can bring the necessary uh, resources into our studio and put people in touch with the right people. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, w we might be interested in Nebraska on agricultural issues, but they could care less in New York or Los Angeles, so we form consortia to deal with certain issues and produce those kinds of programs. The Central Educational Network is something we belong to. There's an Eastern Educational Network and a Southern Educational Conference and a Pacific Mountain Conference. So these regions pool resources and share ideas and production costs and so forth. That happens very, very frequently. Talk about the issue of innovation, innovation in programming, programming ideas, programming in the audience, and how that relates to the public audience in the period that you've been a producer as well as a, uh, the manager as well as person in state government. I'll tell you a, a couple of good ideas. Uh, one from the past and one as I look to the future. The Pacific Mountain Network for a time we used to produce, I mentioned high school swimming and diving, well we did gymnastics, all the non-revenue producing sports. Again, football, basketball can make money, so commercial television stations are all over that, or cable networks like ESPN. But when it comes to volleyball and swimming and diving and baseball and some of those other sports, we had world-class gymnasts here. Uh, we have world-class volleyball team here, but nobody gives them the time of day because commercially they aren't viable, so they loved us. We'd produce those programs, well, so did other public television stations in their local area. So the Pacific Mountain Network got the idea that we ought to share these programs, package them like sort of a wide world of sports, and distribute them all over the country. So we did that. That was a nice, innovative way of using programming. As we look to the future, we're moving from analog to digital. When, when was the innovation? That, that was back about? in the, uh, just before I left, so late 70s, early 80s. But that's just one example. We do that all the time. Programs are being proposed where we might collaborate. Maynard Orm is the general manager in Oregon, and he says, he asks all the Osby group, that's another affinity group of organization of state broadcast executives, how many of you do outdoor programming? Well, we do. So do a number of other states. He'd like to take segments, collect them all, and repackage them into a national outdoor series, if you will. Now that's just in the beginning stages, but it's likely going to happen. Now, as we move from analog to digital, and I look to the future, there's at least three general managers that I've got grown very close to, one from Maryland Public Broadcasting, one from South Carolina, that want to shift the discussion from how we parcel out this new spectrum to what we're going to put on that spectrum and, and develop a skunk works, if you will, to develop new ideas, new applications, killer applications, they call them, that we'll use this spectrum for. So we're probably going to pool some resources, just the three statewide networks, and begin to develop new ideas for use on the digital spectrum, which I find very, very exciting. Uh, there's lots of that kind of innovation happening all over the place. Rob, when you operated the private production company, you were in a for-profit business. Right. Public broadcasting is a not-for-profit business, but it's not a non-profit business. How does one handle the ability to make some money to be able to survive? I think that's a very good question, and it's very delicate. And one of the things I think that is inhibited public broadcasting over time is uh, state networks like Nebraska South Carolina, Kentucky, Louisiana were very afraid to be aggressive about doing uh, projects that could return something on that investment to help support you for fear that it would, it would result in the state cutting off funding. I think that mentality's changed, and I'll give you an example. We owned our own satellite transponder, and we were faced with the daunting responsibility of digitizing this whole network we've set up. Well, it's, it was going to cost a million and a half dollars just to retrofit the receive sites we had in the state. We went to the legislature and said, we think we have enough excess bandwidth on our satellite that if you'll allow us to sell it, we can take the money, the revenue generated from that sale, and digitize this network without using any general fund appropriations. And they, they approved that, and we did it, and we did it successfully. I think there is an attitude at the state legislature to work more with us because they want 
to curb government spending, but at the same time, they don't want to adversely affect the programs and services that we provide. Now, we have to be somewhat careful because we're not in the commercial business. But if there are ways in which we can generate revenues to offset tax support, I think that's going to be welcome now in a way that it hasn't been historically. How do you see the sale of programs produced by Nebraska Educational Television to such commercial cha cable channels as the Learning Channel or something like that? Well, that's another interesting question. Uh, PBS fancies itself as ABC, NBC, or CBS. In other words, we're a national network and you're simply an affiliate. And at the public television level, we're quite, we view this quite differently. We say, no, we're here. We exist to serve Nebraskans. We pay dues to you, and so we're a dues-paying member of PBS. We should have more say in what you do. If you want us to just be an affiliate of PBS, then you should pay us, just like ABC, NBC, or CBS pays their affiliates, and then we'll require us to carry your programs. Otherwise, we're a collection of public television stations that serve a local purpose. Now, having said that, the answer to your question is, um, how does... Uh, what was the what was the question again? It was a uh, the commercial aspect of the making a profit, but for a nonprofit organization. Yes. Okay. Well, PBS is now saying they have to be far more entrepreneurial, so they created the station equity model. And then the equity model was we'll look for other ways to generate revenue, and what we'll do with that revenue is not give it back to you, but we'll take it nationally and reduce the cost to you of acquiring programs. Well, where's the equity? We're not seeing any equity there. All it does is feed that national program service. So we're looking for ways in which we can generate revenue ourselves. Now, it sounds adversarial, and it is. They've always had this struggle. What we've done is we've said, we're first and foremost a member of PBS. So PBS, here's a documentary we want to do on, uh, what was the one, Jesse James. We want to do this documentary on Jesse James. Will you help finance it? PBS said no. Okay, well, we tried. Off to Discovery we go. And Discovery, would you be interested in a co-production of Jesse James? Yes, we would, and we'll put up $100,000. We'll sign the partnership with Discovery. Uh, because first and foremost, we want to serve our constituents. We want high-quality programming. If we can do that as a member of PBS, that's our first choice. If not, we're not bound to stop there. Because ultimately, I want to serve Nebraskans. That's first and foremost. And if I can get something done by partnering with someone else, so be it. And that's going to be a very contentious issue as we move into the future here. But we've, we've carried stacks of proposals to the Discovery Channel and to the Learning Channel. And that's why people begin to see us looking quite a bit alike. But if we can't get cooperation and a return on that investment with PBS, then in order to survive and continue to provide that local service that we want to provide, we'll look, look elsewhere. How do you see public radio as part of the mix? Public radio, it's real interesting, was very, uh, it was very hard to get public radio passed in the legislature in Nebraska. I, this is me speculating now, but I think the reason for that is radio stations have a much smaller, finite audience that they serve. There's not a big share, so to make a profit at a local radio station is really kind of tough. If you put in even public broadcasting, even public radio, and you erode even a little bit of that radio's audience, you, you tend to hurt them. And so I think that's why the commercial radio lobby was very effective in Nebraska. I, don't, I really don't blame them very much. It really isn't competition in terms of programming. If you look at the programming, it's way different. It threatens no one. But it does peel off a little bit of their relationship. Once we got on, we, get, we got no state funding when we started public radio in Nebraska. Groups in local areas served by that transmitter formed a grassroots coalition and raised matching funds with federal PTFP money, public television, public telecommunications, uh, PTFP, funding program, I think it is. They raised the matching money to get this public radio network on the air. And for years, there was no state dollars invested until two years ago. They finally gave us a little bit of money to upgrade some ancient equipment and move into the digital era. But we were a real threat, I think, in the beginning. And now that we've been on the air for about 10 years, people are beginning to understand the difference between public radio and commercial radio. And I don't think we're seen as a threat anymore. How's the entrepreneurial feature fit radio? 
Well, it's a little bit different in that in that television, we go after a project by project and look for underwriting. In radio, they, uh, the listeners own that station. That's their format. They listen to chunks, and they feel much more ownership in that. So it's a bit of a different... It's more like commercial radio is, in, in that you're selling parts of the day, or rather than underwriting a program, if you will, because it's essentially news and classic music, classical music. That's all you have. And so it's more of an investment in the entire operation of radio than a single program. So it's a bit of a different animal, but very loyal support. And if you look at historically, right now, radio is enjoying a much more brisk growth in, in private membership support than television. I think because television is far more mature, radio is only 10 years old. So we're seeing a lot of people invest individual donations in the support of public radio. Talk about your perceptions of broadcasting, both public and commercial, during the years that you were in the private production business. Perceptions of public and commercial? What was going on in programming? What were innovations like? What was the level of interest? To, was, the, was the innovation up or down? Or? Well, well, let me take public television first, because I think initially uh, the word educational was part of public broadcasting. And if you look at the evolution of public television, when I went out into the private sector, education sort of went away. It was no longer in vogue to claim that you're the educational resource. Always has been in Nebraska, but if you look nationally at the PBS system, educational was sort of removed and set aside, and we became public television. You didn't hear much about education until Newt Gingrich came in and said, let's get rid of that, and suddenly people said, but we're educational television and now it's back. So I would say in the evolution of public broadcasting in the time I've been in it, it started off as clearly educational, then we moved our emphasis to public and created a core schedule and looked much more like a network and now education's back in the mix and we're very local and, and very responsive. If you look at commercial television in the same amount of time, I saw a trend toward moving away from local service to a lot of acquisitions, and then when the duopoly rule went away, a lot of mergers took place, and then they would consolidate, downsize, improve the bottom line on the balance sheet, sell off the station, make a lot of money and leave, and you saw little regard for public service at the local level. So local service today in commercial television is nearly non-existent. As I said, there's news, and there's a handful of public affairs programming, but you don't see nearly what you used to see, like children's programming. In fact, the FCC had to require uh, commercial stations to carry at least three hours of children's programming a week. We do six hours a day. We do, that, we, we do their requirement before noon every day. That's the difference. I think now it's just the local commercial station has become a pass-through for the network affiliate and a cash cow, and and when you do away with duopoly, you see these huge mega mergers taking place, and it's all related to bottom line and very little local service. When you were in the private production business, who were your best clients? Not by name, but by percentage in terms of what kind of businesses or agencies or what are they represented? You know, I did very little work. I thought I'd do more with advertising agencies. I didn't do a lot. I did some. Uh, there was a good mix there. Uh, I did some work with state agencies because, again, I had been in a state agency and knew the kinds of needs they had. Um, and then I did some, uh, like, association work, treating, uh, teaching associations how to deal with the media, public relations, uh, handled issues, was, got involved in some political campaign, so it was kind of all over the place, public relations as well as production. Production was slow in coming because uh, a lot of the corporations in the state of Nebraska would be defined in federal terms as small businesses. If you have less than uh, fewer than 500 employees, you're considered small business. Well, 99% of the businesses in Nebraska, at least 95% probably, are small businesses. And for them to invest in that technology to train their employees was a, was a pretty big chunk of change. So uh, we did a lot of... Uh, training, planning, long-range planning, communication planning, media training, and then uh, uh, some of the larger companies we did uh, video. How would you assess the quality of productions, uh, style of operations for political campaigns 
on television since you've been in the state? I think political campaigns, uh, it's a kind of a sore point with me. Uh, it's interesting, some of the local races can barely afford to do anything. Um, if you look at statewide races, there's so much more to invest and so much more to spend on media that the, the candidates tend to gravitate toward the Washington consultants to get their work drives me nuts because ultimately it's the message to the audience and we understood the audience better than any Washington consultant but nonetheless there was so much to be you know gained or lost by that political campaign that they gravitated toward the people that they quote knew what they were doing I think the quality of the commercials are just fine uh, except for this negative campaigning stuff. I mean, the content is terrible, production quality is high, but this negative campaigning stuff is just, it's reached all new low levels. Uh, so it, it has deteriorated. Production quality has increased, and a lot of the work goes out of the state when there's a statewide campaign, which drives me nuts. Rob, we've pretty well come close to the end of the time that I've bartered with you for. Is there anything else that you'd like to put in here that we haven't covered? I just, I don't know if this um, came across or not, but I think this is probably one of the most exciting times to be in broadcasting ever because we're changing everything. As I said, the, the standard for television was established back in the 1940s and has remained constant ever since. We're now changing everything. Uh, we're now changing to a digital environment, which also allows us to change the nature of programming to become far more interactive. It'll be a brand new type of service that we're de defining that, that we've never seen before. So even though it's kind of threatening and it's very expensive and we have a big hurdle to cross to get into this or through this transition, once through it, we will completely redefine how you use your television set and you'll see the merger of your a personal computer and television set come together in ways you never imagined and it's going to be the most exciting time ever. So with that I guess we'll invite ourselves back to talk with you in three or four years and well, see how it came great. out. Yeah we'll see how we do. Rod Bates thank you very much again this is recorded on August the 3rd 1998. Thank you. Thank you.